Rob Schallenberger, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Hey, thanks so much, John. Excited to be here. And thanks to all the listeners who joined us. Uh, we're going to have a great experience in the next 30 minutes. That's my hope. <laughs> yeah, I'm super excited. Thank you for joining me. And it turned out in the pre-interview as we were chatting, we realized we're both located in Orem, Utah, south of Salt Lake City. So we're actually pretty close to each other. Um, but we're doing this remotely over Zoom, as I usually do all my interviews. So uh, anyways, it's great to be with you, Rob. And we may have to catch lunch one of these days uh, when we can actually be together in person. Uh, as yeah, we get- love that. Today, we're going to be talking about your recent book, Do What Matters Most, and we're going to zoom in on the three habits that will ha have the biggest impact on someone's personal and professional life. Uh, as we get started, I wanted to share Rob's bio with everybody. Rob Schallenberger is one of the world's leading authorities on leadership, time management, and productivity. He's trained and spoken for hundreds of organizations around the world, such as Dallas Cowboys, Charles Schwab, PepsiCo and many, many others. He's the CEO of Becoming Your Best Global Leadership and is the best-selling author of five different books focused on leadership, time management, and productivity. His company has established a top-ranked certification program for other trainers and coaches. Rob began his career by spending two years of service in Bolivia. Following his service mission, he attended Utah State University, where he graduated in 2000. He went on to earn an MBA from Colorado State University. He served as an F-16 pilot in the United States Air Force for 11 years, and he was an advanced agent for Air Force One and traveled the world working with foreign embassies and the Secret Service. He's been married for 23 years and has four beautiful children. What an incredible background and career. Um, it, based on when you graduated, I imagine we're fairly close in age, though it seems like you've accomplished way more than me. No, <laughs> so no, no. <laughs> good, good work on, on a really great career, and it's a pleasure to be with you today. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background before we dive on into the conversation? Oh, you know, I just, it is this funny. You know, we read backgrounds, and we all have these different resumes, and, and sometimes, you know, we look at those, you know, you look at someone like a Tony Robbins or anybody else, for that matter. You look at something like that, and you say, wow, this person doesn't have any issues, no, no, no challenges. One of the things I've learned, you know, whether it's through our executive coaching program or whoever, it doesn't matter if a person has a net worth of a billion dollars. It doesn't matter if they've done this or that. Everybody has different challenges. And that's exactly why this podcast today, I hope John will be so valuable is because as we're talking about do what matters most, you know, regardless of what we've done in the past, the question is, where are we today and what's going to happen going forward? And that becomes a very empowering conversation you know, regardless of what our background was, is where are we today and where do we go from here? Yeah, yeah, I love that. And let's let's start there. Let's start with um, unpacking the uh, the recent book, Do What Matters Most. What was really the motivation behind this book? Tell us a little bit about it, and then we can start to pull it apart a bit. Yeah, so here's how that came about. I'll give you the two-minute version. So leaving the Air Force 11 years ago, uh, my father and I joined forces. We started becoming your best global leadership together. And what we were researching at that time was what sets apart great leaders and high performers from everyone else. And we found that there are 12 principles of highly successful leaders that you see over and over in the very best. They're very predictable of success in our relationships and our personal lives, organizationally across the board. So that's what went into our first book, Becoming Your Best, the 12 principles of highly successful leaders. And we've had the chance, you know, to meet with leaders all over the world from the president of Rwanda to the Philippines, you know, all different continents. Well, meeting with these different organizations, three of those 12 principles really resonated deeply with people, John, and they all had to do with time management and productivity. And while we had scratched the surface, we realized that nobody had ever really gone into a in-depth research in those particular areas. And so that's what we did. And we now call that our do what matters most research. And what we were focusing on was things like time management, productivity. And we started asking specific questions within organizations, for example, you know, as a listener, how many times have you heard someone say, find your purpose, find your passion, find your why? <laughs> and yet, how often was it done? That was our question. How many people have actually done that? How about goals? You know, we've heard at nauseum the term goals, have your goals, do your goals, New Year's resolutions, whatever. How many people actually have personal and professional written goals? That was what we wanted to find out. You know, how about weekly planning? How many people actually had a process to prioritize what mattered most at the daily and the weekly level? And this is where, John, we were fascinated with what we found. And we found that 68% of people felt like prioritizing their time was their number one challenge. And for those listening, I don't know if you can relate to that, but it just seems like for so many people, they would say, you know, there's this demand on my time where my kids want a piece. 
you know, my spouse, my friends, my family, our coworkers, <laughs> everybody seems to want a piece of your time. And how do you juggle that all and stay on top of your priorities and what matters most? Yeah. And that's really consistent with what I hear from people uh, most often very successful people. Uh, yes. so, clear, so clearly they've, they've been able to figure it out well enough to find great success in life. Um, but still they, they just talk about uh, time management. How do I better utilize my time? How do I prioritize and focus on what's most important? Uh, it's, it's a real challenge. And to your point about daily and weekly kind of just regular check-ins and making sure that we're on top of that, uh, in the daily hustle and bustle and, you know, daily grind of work and home life and everything like that tends to get set aside um, as we're just trying to respond to all the immediate crises and needs of those around us. Yeah, that's exactly it. And here's what was interesting, John, is 80% of people surveyed did not have a process to schedule their priorities or balance their time outside of sticky notes and to-do lists. And so clearly with some of the research and people can read it in the book and, and what we found, there had to be a better way. And this is where we developed three habits that we call the big three that will empower someone to do exactly what the title of the book is, and that is do what matters most. And it's interesting, John, because we actually kind of went back and forth. Should we name the book What Matters Most or Do What Matters Most? And in the end, it's not thinking about it that matters. It's what we do that people will remember or that impacts our health. You know, our kids aren't going to remember what we thought about. What they're going to remember is what we did with them. Quality and quantity of time. Same with our employees. Same with our clients our health. And so do what matters most became the title of the book. And these three habits are total game changers and less than 1% of people, John apply these habits. And what's exciting is that anyone can. And, and so today, you know, we can go into any direction you want on these habits. Uh, but this is where do what matters most was born. And one of the things that I love about this thought are those four words, do what matters most. I mean, just in the title, it already gets our minds thinking about, you know, what are we doing with our time? <laughs> Where are yeah. we investing our time? And so these three powerful habits are game changers. Yeah. And, and I like the focus on doing because it, it is about implementation. We can have really great intentions and great ideas, um, but being able to translate the abstract ideas and intentions into real concrete action we're actually implementing them and actually doing things and accomplishing things, that's really where productivity is at and where impact is at. Uh, so I, I'm all for doing self-reflective work and, and, and spending time thinking and, and thoughtful mindfulness practices and those sorts of things. But we have to get to the point where we, we transition from that internal work to the external work where we can put it into action. And so doing is how we go about that. Yeah, and, and the promise is a person that implements these habits, John, that their productivity will increase by at least 30 to 60%, and that they will accomplish between 800 to 1,200 additional things this year that they would not have done without those habits, and all with less stress. So it's kind of like, who wouldn't want to do this, right? <laughs> Show me what they are, because I mean, you know, like you said, it doesn't matter what level of outward success someone has, I guarantee you pull someone aside you're going to find someone that has different challenges internally. And this is the idea of do what matters most is how do we create a balance of success stories across every role and area of our life? Yeah, I love that. So let's, let's dig in and talk about those three, the big three, those three habits that are going to have the biggest impact on someone's personal life and professional life from the research that your team has conducted. Yeah. Okay. So let me just list what the three habits are. And on the outside, you may say, Oh, that's kind of sounds simple. Remember, it may sound that way, but for as much as they're talked about, they're rarely being done. So habit number one. And can I just say too, before we dive in, based on what you just said, absolutely. Some of the most transformative types of um, approaches to us finding success in life aren't rocket science. They're generally fairly simple. Uh, the, the real hard part is consistency, right? Consistency, the, amen. Consistency, yes. dedication, resilience, and, and just continuing to push towards um, those outcomes. And, and that's really hard because people's attention wanes, their, their motivation and interest level wanes. And ultimately we, we just have to be consistent. And that's exactly it. At the beginning of a seminar or even the book, chapter one of the book is that do what matters most is both a mindset and a skill set. You know, I'll list the three habits. They're very much a skill set. The mindset is everything you just described. It's the willingness to apply the habits. It's the discipline to be consistent. And what's interesting, John, is everything flows through these. 
what we do with our time, whether it's exercise, meditation, yoga, you know, strategic planning with our team, our organization, date night with your spouse, time with your kids, all of that stuff flows through these three habits. So here are the three. And here's what makes these unique is we invite a person to apply all three of these habits through the lens of the five to seven roles that matter most to them. So if you're listening to this podcast, I would ask you, what are your five to seven roles that matter most to you? So for example, if you're a parent, obviously parent would be one of those roles. If you're in a relationship, partner or spouse would be one of those roles. CEO, manager, friend, brother, sister, son, daughter, philanthropist, coach, et cetera. So you get the idea. And by the way, the most important role is personal, self. You know, we've got to have our own flame burning if we want to light other candles. And so what we invite, invite people to do is apply these three habits through the lens of the five to seven roles that matter most. And that's what makes this process so unique and powerful. So habit number one is to develop a written personal vision by role. That's the high level. It's a 30,000 foot view of your life. It's the very best version that you could describe of yourself in each of those roles. So for me, you know, father, husband, CEO, in my personal life, what does the very best version of me look like my vision for each of those roles? Less than 2% of people have done that, John. So again, for as much as it's talked about, rarely being done. The next habit, imagine going down a funnel. So the vision is the high level 30,000 foot view. The next habit is to develop your roles and goals for this year. In other words, one to four specific measurable goals in each of those roles that you would like to accomplish this year. You know, I heard Matt McConaughey, Matthew McConaughey the other day when I was driving in, he said, you've got to define what success looks like for you. Uh, great. I mean, it's another nice soundbite, right? <laughs> and he's exactly right, but it's a soundbite, meaning that roles and goals are exactly what you're doing there by defining success in each of your different roles, something that is specific and measurable and gives you a clear target. Only 10% of people have both personal and professional written goals. And I'm not talking about the proverbial New Year's resolution that gets broken two weeks into the year. You know, the way to do this is a real skill set, and it's talked about in chapters five and six of the book. And the third habit, John, and the most important habit by far and away is the one that connects our vision and goals down to the daily and weekly level, and that is the habit of pre-week planning. And we define, define a very specific process, and if it's okay, I'd love to talk about it at some point in the next few minutes, because initially someone will say, oh yeah, I do pre-week planning. And I'll ask, well, tell me what you do. And they say, well, on Friday you know, or Saturday, I'll go through my week professionally, and I'll say, here's all the things I need to do this week professionally. And one of my favorite quotes, and it's the way we start the book, Do What Matters Most, is this, good, better, best, never let it rest till the good is better and the better is best. And that form of pre-week planning, while it may be good, there is a better way that brings balance to all of these different roles in our lives and dramatically will increase productivity. So when you bring all three of these habits together, John, total game changers. Imagine how it would feel to have a high level 30,000 foot view vision for each role. And then have one to four specific goals that you're focusing on that you say that will, that will empower me to be successful in that role this year. And then pre week planning where we're asking ourselves what matters most each week by role. And so we're actually connecting that down to the daily weekly level. And that's why these three habits are so complementary to each other and are total game changers. And I don't care if it's a CEO, if it's a frontline employee, if it's a stay at home parent, they were equally powerful in any one of those person's lives and will impact every one of our lives. And I've been doing each of these for 23 years. And my world would collapse in on itself if you took away any one of those habits, especially pre-week planning. So that's an overview of the big three. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, that's super helpful. And I appreciate um, that, particularly the last point. I think big picture, zooming down you know, further, 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 getting more detailed into that pre-week planning is excellent. And we can certainly unpack that and talk about more specifics around um, the, the pre-week planning methodology that you uh, espouse and that you use in your own personal life. I, I've seen a variety of different approaches and methods to that, um, but ultimately, certainly from a self-reflective standpoint, it's important, but also just from a, a practicality, the logistics standpoint, just understanding and being able to like wrap your mind around everything uh, and then being able to, to uh, figure out logistically how you're going to try to fit everything in. Uh, it's super important. And it also... Um, in my experience, really helps to highlight um, those elements that just don't seem to matter as much. As you start to look at your week and you're like, oh my gosh, look at the, this mess of a calendar, all these things I need to accomplish, then you can actually 
look at things that you can just get rid of or delegate, send, you know, send a, a colleague to that meeting instead of you going to that meeting or whatever. Uh, and then you can hone in on really what's going to matter most and what's going to make the most impact. All right. So that's exactly it, John. You know, when we do pre planning, it really forces us to look at, are we doing what matters most? And it opens up an entire, entirely new lens for us. And that's what makes us so powerful. So maybe if you don't mind, John, do you mind if I just share a couple of specific examples of pre-planning yeah, and what it is? Would that be all right? Absolutely. So first of all, here's what pre-planning is. It's different than traditional planning, to-do lists, things like that. Think of it this way. It's about scheduling your priorities rather than prioritizing your schedule. It's about leading a life by design rather than living a life by default. And this is the whole essence of do what matters most. And pre planning becomes the process and tool that empowers us to do exactly that. So let me just give you two examples. First, I'll introduce the process, give you those, those two examples. There are really four steps to pre-week planning. And most people will do this between Friday afternoon to Sunday evening, because obviously Monday morning, you know, we're in the thick of the fire. And we got the term pre-week planning because a pilot will always do pre-flight planning before they jump in the jet, Right. And none of us would dare jump in a jet if we knew the pilot had skipped their pre-flight planning <laughs> because it's going to result in chaos, confusion, et cetera. So how many of us go into our weeks without a plan and expect a different result than the pilot would get? And this is why it's so important to set aside that 20 to 40 minutes to use these or follow these four steps. And that is this. Step one is to review your vision and goals. Sounds so simple, yet only 1% of people do that. In other words, our weekly actions are going to align with our vision and goals, what we've already put in that effort and work to define. Step two is to identify your roles, the same roles that you would have used in your vision and goals. Step three is to ask yourself, what can you do that matters most in each of those roles this week? That's a powerful question because it's no longer, you know, this proverbial, here's what I have to do this week. Now you're thinking about what you can do. And that's a totally different thought process taking one of your employees to lunch, calling your clients on their birthdays, sending a birthday package. That's all what we call Q2. So you're thinking about what you can do in each of your roles. And that's why imagination starts to really get stimulated. And you start to think of things that otherwise didn't happen. And the fourth step is to simply assign a time to each one. That's it. Seems so simple, right? And we spent thousands of hours, John, looking at all kinds of different planning systems to develop those four simple yet powerful steps. We have an online extension that people can use for Google or Outlook, and we have the physical planners for people that like paper, and that's the tool to implement the process. So let me just share two very brief examples, if that's all right, John, of the power of this. Yes, please. So there's a Pepsi executive that learned how to do pre planning, and I like the way you said this earlier, John. On the outside, he would appear to be very successful, you know, seasoned, young 60s, uh, top of his game at Pepsi, financially well-to-do. From the outside, you look at him and say, man, that guy has it all together. Well, when he learned the process of pre-week planning, this was a totally new and foreign concept to him to look at his week and life through the lens of his roles. And so he came up with one of the roles is father. And he wrote, call my son, you know, something specific that he would do that week, call my son. And we asked, well, why, you know, why? I mean, cool, but why? And he said, well, because seven years ago, my son and I got into an argument and we haven't talked since. I mean, that's a big deal, right? So we asked, well, when will you do it? Wednesday, seven o'clock. Great. Six months later, when we came back, you know, he ran up to us and he's like, I did it. You know, I called my son and let me tell you about it. And he shared this story. And what happened was he called his son that night because it was there in his planner. His, he had done his pre-week planning. And as soon as they started talking, it was amazing because he commented they didn't even remember what they had argued about seven years ago. And now they talk every week and they're best friends. And what's crazy about this, John, is he went on to learn on that call that he had two grandchildren who he didn't even know existed. And now we might ask, why in the world did it take him seven years to make that call? Well, for some of us listening, why in the world have we start, not started working on our health earlier? Why have we waited this long to start addressing our mental health issues? You know, whatever it might be for anxiety or depression. How about a relationship with a son or daughter like this Pepsi executive or a spouse or at work? There's a million different things that we're all looking at. And so we're actually a lot more similar than that, similar than we might realize to that Pepsi executive, maybe just a different area of our life. And for him, pre-week planning was a total game changer because once he made that call and established that relationship, he said it freed him up 
to be the type of executive that he had not been for years. He was no longer carrying that weight on his shoulders that he'd been carrying. And so this is the power of it. I mean, it doesn't have to be rocket science. For me, you know, a couple of years ago, I remember writing a note to my daughter, Lana, because that's what I had put in the role of father, write a note to Lana, each of my kids, something every week. You know, I left a little note on her bed and then I went to Indianapolis to do a keynote. On the way back, my wife texted me a picture and she said, Rob, Lana snuck into our room and she put this note on our headboard. And it said, I love you to the moon and back even more than all the jelly beans in the world. <laughs> and it started this little back and forth. So how long, you know, did it take me to write that note? It took 30 seconds to a minute. How many times could we be doing things like that, both personally and professionally, but it's really about just making the time for it. And that's why pre-week planning gives us the process of the medium. And it's not just thinking of the big thing I could accomplish this day. That's important. It's not just sitting down in the morning and say, what are my top three priorities of the day? All of that is good. But in the spirit of good, better, best, there's just nothing out there right now that allows us to look at our lives through the lens of our different roles and ask what matters most in each role. Yeah, yeah. I really like that. And, and it just highlights... <clears throat> the, the, the human tendency that we all have to procrastinate, even those yeah. things that we hold very close and dear to our heart that we feel is very, very important, like a relationship with a child. Um, when, when we just get, <clears throat> excuse me, when we get busy into our day, uh, unless we have those things kind of thought out in advance, most of the time they're going to go left undone. Now that's not to say I'm, I'm all for organic uh, opportunities to connect with people. And, and certainly we can, we can uh, try to schedule, schedule ourselves um, in a way that we have time allotted where we can just be with people so that we can have those organic types of interactions and those meaningful, um, genuine types of interactions. But if, if we're not planning in advance, a lot of those things just aren't going to happen because our lives are just too busy. And we have a thousand reasons why we can put that call off to our son, right? Or whatever the case may be. Um, we all have our reasons. We all have um, the, the justifications in our minds, we, but putting it down on paper or putting it in your Google calendar or whatever, it just is that next step that now is going to nudge you towards actually carrying it out. Well, that's exactly it, John. And that's, that's why this is next level time management. Because, you know, like we talked about earlier, a lot of people are used to looking at their week professionally and saying, here's what I need to do professionally. Good, better, best. And you do pre-week planning and you start looking at your week through the lens of your different roles. And here's the other caveat to this. Even professionally, one of the things that we invite people to do in our book is to look at their life and ask, how do we shift to be transformational rather than transactional? Transactional is just showing up and going through the motions. Transformational is changing something you know, improving a process, making something better as a result of our touch. So whether it's as a parent, as a CEO, as a manager, whether it's taking care of our own lives, how do we make that shift to the transformational type activities? And that is very intentional. And I love what you said, John. Pre-week planning does not take away from spontane spontaneity. It does not take away from, you know, those impromptu things. The difference is it will allow us to do so many more of those. And we'll do so many more things that to others felt impromptu or spontaneous, you know, like, for example, a note to your wife or husband. To them, that feels totally spontaneous. <laughs> Even though it was part of our pre-week planning, it had a big impact on our relationship. You know, a date night. How about this? If you're listening and you're a senior leader in your organization, one of the most important things you can do as a leader is develop a clear strategic plan that creates alignment for your organization. One of the things we do is help companies with that, but only 30% of companies have a clear strategic plan that creates alignment. If you're a CEO, a president, senior VP, whatever, this could be one of your goals, your key areas of focus. Develop your strategic plan for 2022 by January 1st. That is a very clear target. Well, pre-week plan is gonna be the medium by which you're gonna make time to make that happen. So it really is just about what matters most to you and then doing those things. And the vision, goals, and pre-week planning give us the process, the lens through which to do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, Rob, it has just been a pleasure. I note the time and it has flown by. I probably need to get let you go and get on with your busy day. But before we close for today, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your team, uh, your work, uh, your books, all of those sorts of things. And then give us a final word on the topic for today. Okay, yeah. So here's my invitation, John. I am an avid book reader. And the reason why is because people can put a lifetime of research and focus into a particular area 
And we can learn from them what would have taken us the equivalent of the same amount of time or effort that they put into it, which we may or may not ever do in this lifetime. So I can tap into a lifetime of experience by investing three to four hours in reading someone's book. And I have learned so much by reading other people's books and, and drawing on that skill set and mindset. So I would invite anybody listening to this right now to put these three habits to the test. And here's very specifically what I'm going to invite you to do. And then, of course, it's your decision whether you do it or not. Number one is go to Amazon and get the book, Do What Matters Most, and read it in the next 30 days and test the power of these habits in your own life. Number two, what will make it a lot easier to do that is get the extension for either Chrome or Outlook by going to dowhatmattersmostapp.com. It is not an app for your phone. There is not enough real estate, John, on the phone to do pre-week planning. You need an actual screen, desktop or laptop. So it's an extension that can be used for Outlook or Chrome. Go to dowhatmattersmostapp.com, get the extension, and just test pre-week planning for four weeks. See what impact it has in your life. And I guarantee 100% of the time it will be life-changing. And that's a bold promise. And the only way to test me is to do that. <laughs> and so invitation number one is get the book, do what matters most, read it in the next 30 days, develop your vision, your goals, and do pre-week planning for at least four weeks and see what impact it has in your life. And then share it with others, the other members of your team, the other members of your organization, your family, because otherwise nothing will change in their lives unless you become the catalyst to do that. And this is the essence of leading a life by design rather than living a life by default. And for anybody that would look at training options or certification or keynotes or things like that, you can find us at becomingyourbest.com. And that's probably the easiest, most central site to go to find all the different events and things that are happening and how to get certified and so on like that. And I just wanna thank all our listeners, John. Thank you for doing this. You don't have to do this and you're doing it. Our listeners, you did not have to be here today and yet you are. And so thank you to you, John, for doing this. And thank you to those who tuned in to listen to this podcast today. Thank you, Rob. It has been a pleasure. I really appreciate your time uh, sharing all of your insights and tips on how we can be more effective and, and have more fulfilling lives through the process of, of establishing these habits and, and planning and, and just being more proactive rather than reactive to uh, the world, we, the messy, complex world we find ourselves in. I encourage listeners to reach out, to get connected, find out more about what Rob and his team can do for you. Check out um, the book, check out the, the tools, everything that can be useful and beneficial to you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week.